Hey guys, and welcome to episode 34 of the Revive Yourself podcast. Here we go. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Have you got a health issue that just won't go away no matter what you try? Then welcome to the Revive Yourself podcast, where we reveal the secrets to long-lasting health by getting to the root cause of problems that no one else is talking about. So you can have more energy, clear skin, healthier hair, a leaner physique, more confidence, and most importantly, do the things you love and live the life you deserve. Here's your host, Ryan Martin. So guys, welcome to episode 34. Hope you're well. Um, hope everyone, your family's doing good. Um, and as always, uh, if they're not, then head on over to www.reviveyourself.co and join in our free four-day mini course, which is going to teach you what you need to do to get over any chronic illness, whether it be a gut issue, a skin issue, chronic fatigue, adrenal fatigue, thyroid issue, whatever it is. I keep saying it, but I've been getting so many great reports from it, helping so many people out. I want to keep pushing you guys towards it. You're going to learn a hell of a lot from that. Um, today's interview, oh, and just before I actually go into that, I want to say the, the response I've got from last week's interview with Rick Simpson has been phenomenal. People have uh, uh, been looking into doing their own research, been been asking me questions, learning loads, and just finding out the powerful, powerful healing benefits of cannabis oil. So that's awesome. So I'm glad you all enjoyed it. Um, today's interview is with a coach called Dax Moy, uh, the only Dax Moy in the world, <laughs> as it as it goes, and we're talking all about neuroscience and why he moved into coaching rather than being a, a trainer and what it's meant. Um, and it's all going into brain set, which is a topic that I really want to introduce to you guys more and more because so many people don't understand the power of the brain in terms of it is the most complex organ in the human body, but people don't understand the the role it plays in decisions we make. For example, when a football player, um, when someone get, tackles, has a when, when another player tackles a football player badly, the player gets up and maybe headbutts him or does something ridiculous. People say, "Oh, that player was out of his mind." Well, yeah, he actually was. He was actually out of his mind. He was actually out of his human brain because the brain split up into three different parts. Uh, it's something we're going to go into here. And until those two two animal parts of the brain are um, are satisfied, satisfied, then you never get into a human brain, which is something that we're going to be talking about here. And it's a, I'm going to get a lot more, um, I'm going to do some stuff on this myself for you guys, going into certain a- aspects of it. And I'm going to be getting a lot more guests on this because it's a very, very important part of health and understanding why we reach for certain things and why we do certain things. And people say, talk about sabotaging and they talk about mindset, but they don't actually realize it's actually a lot of it to do with the brain. So, we're talking about brain set. So, Dax uh, actually gives he gives you a uh, little um, biography of himself, anyway. So, without further ado, here he is. Enjoy the interview, and I'll see you on the other side. Hey guys, just here with Dax Moy. Um, those of you in the fitness or wellness or health industry will probably know a little bit about Dax. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting him about eight nine months ago now when I went on one of his one of his um, courses, which was out in Thailand, Guru, which had a uh, which I had a fantastic experience on, and which is mind blowing. Where anyone I would recommend it to. And today we're just going to cover a little bit about what Dax has moved into in the last sort of how many years you've been doing this? Um, six, seven, seven years. This this particular <laughs> phase of my career. Yeah. Six, seven years because beforehand he was like many of us, start out a, a trainer. And he's moved into the coaching aspect of things um, whilst looking at how he can really have a long-lasting transformation on his clients. So I'll hand it over to Dax just to give you a little bit about his background and where he started out from, which is quite, which is quite fascinating really. So Dax, over to you. <laughs> Thanks. How far back do you want me to take it? Um, well, you, you don't have to. You know, it depends. Um, <laughs> you, they don't have to go into what happened with your, with your dad if you don't want to. But before you were a, uh, you were in the, you were in the special forces. So, so, well, so, so kind of if, if, I, if I, I just kind of look at it, time when I grew up, I grew up extremely poor, housing estates here in the UK, uh, violent, alcoholic stepfather, 
Um, by, now, by the age of 15, I sent my dad through the park, protect my mum from a, from a violent assault. Left school early because of that and went off and joined the Paris, later on joined the Royal Marines, later on joined another unit which was all about um, surveillance and target acquisition. Right? So I've done, I've done the military stuff, and I can't, well, like, so now I'm giving you a really, really quick kind of overlay, right? Um, because when I became a, a full-time civilian, I basically became a personal trainer. Um, I got a job at a, at a local gym, and the gym could only give me two hours a week to begin with, pay, and it was five pounds an hour, so I was only ten pounds an hour as a, as a, as a gym instructor. And I was applying for positions and all kinds of stuff. But while I was doing that, I was I was doing what most personal trainers didn't really want to do, and that was I was spending my life doing the stuff that I loved, which was both training, talking to people about training, and then being in front of people that wanted to know about training. Right. So I was only getting paid ten pounds a week, but I was on the studio floor for about on the gym floor for about forty hours a week most weeks, just talking to people and helping people. And when I got my PT certificate, when I was allowed to go a personal trainer as opposed to as opposed to be a gym instructor, um, I very very quickly then got myself to the point where I was the busiest trainer in the gym by far. As in, I had more clients for myself than all the other trainers in the gym put together, because everyone knew me. I'd already been proving I could help them um, when money wasn't changing hands, and it was just a really easy transition. So that's one of the first things I would say to trainers and coaches is like just go if you love it that much just go and do it anyway like the the money is secondary I mean we all want money right? we want to put food on the table it's kind of secondary um, I then became a GP referral specialist the, the very first GP referral program in the country was started up by the gym that I was working for um, for those who, that don't know what that is that's and people who have medical conditions like diseases and disabilities and injuries and stuff they come along they, they, they work with trainers and, and gym instructors on some very specific programs to help them with their condition. Well, what I very quickly moved into was the more neurological side of things. And what I was finding was that people that had been in wheelchairs for a long time were able to walk, and people that had, had strokes and couldn't use their arms were able to suddenly start lifting. And physiotherapists and doctors and all the other people associated with the program pretty soon were like wondering why, what was it that I was doing that was different. I didn't consider it different. I just, to be honest, I was making up most of this stuff as I went along. So, Theoretically, this should work, and I'd do it, and I'd try it, and it would work, and then people would get out of wheelchairs, and people would start using their arms again. It was pretty cool. Um, after after a while doing that, I, I became very, very good at the, the neurological rehab side. I actually went to work for a neurological rehab center um, as one of you know. So I, this this was still back in the day where I was like riding on my bike, my push bike from my place to, to gyms, or from gyms to clients' houses, or from clients' houses up to this rehab center, and I was like. I was on a bike and I had a big physio ball that I would inflate every every time I was going into a place and deflate every time I was coming out of it and so I could stick it in my backpack and all that kind of stuff. Then, um, kind of cut a long story short, I ended up with my own place. Um, had my own personal training studio. Within six months, I, I outgrew it. Kind of, I had a team working for me. Within a year, I was on national TV and magazines on radios. Um, and from then, I've really gone on to do a lot of really interesting things, everything from the more mechanical side of injury rehab, so running certifications and courses all around the world for that, for my kinetic chain specialist program, up to teaching people how to do more like motivational interviewing and coaching. And in the last few years, I've moved much more into the, you know, I've got now these three maps, the body map, mind map, and bio map, which is kind of helping people up, people understand their bodies at very, very different levels. At the same time, you know, across the course of my career, I've worked with royalty, CEOs, pop stars, polar explorers, um, authors, actors, performing artists, all kinds of stuff. And yeah, so, so uh, I've, I've done a bit. Yeah, done a bit. Cool. <laughs> so when you first started out and you had your first and you had your studio, we were back. So you, so you're based in Islington. People who don't know, he has got a uh, his own studio in Upper Street, and you've been there how long? Um, well, I've been on Upper Street for 15 years. So I've been in, in this particular building for about 13. 13 years, and I mean, people probably know as, as I, I actually put in one of the posts. Um, I mean, for what you charge for your services is, is quite is quite a lot for some some people. But obviously, other coaches around the world, as you pointed out, they charge a lot more. But you were you were the most expensive PT at one point, and um, but but now, if you, as you're talking about, you've actually transitioned into coaching, um, and what you charge, etc. For your 
for your year-long programs and for your retreats, etc. Why would you say that you actually did, I know you, you probably mentioned it a little bit, but why did you transfer from being a personal trainer into a coach? What was it that you started to notice or the differences you started to make or what difference could you make to someone being a coach rather than just concentrating on being a personal trainer? It's a brilliant, brilliant question. And I guess they're not involved in this whole thing. Um, I started out with most people like a trainer, right? And trainers, well, what do they do? They train, right? So we believe that most things can be sold with, sold with training, like get you stronger, get you bigger, get you slimmer, like whatever it is. Well, that, hey, Dax, I want this to happen. And you go, okay, well, this is the training program for it. I want that to happen. Okay, well, this is the training program. So it was all about the training. I was like, cool, kind of. And then I found that after being a good trainer for a while, that there was something missing. It was like, oh, right, okay, people, people, aren't, people aren't getting the full result because as you've heard and as the public have heard thousands of times, like you can't out-train a poor diet. So I went, okay, I'm going, to become, I'm going to really deep dive into nutrition. And I did and went down the detox route and I wrote the Elimination Diet book and kind of, you know, over half a million downloads worldwide with, with that book. Affected a lot of lives, got a lot of really positive feedback about it. Went, wow, I found it, I found the holy grail, the training and this elimination based diet going together, wow, it's everything. And then I found that people would, like most trainers have experienced, people would get great results in 30, 60, maybe 90 days. And then gradually all the results would start to disappear again. I was meeting very few people in life who still had their results months and months later. So as you know yourself, Ryan, right, the, the industry is basically mostly built around our 30, 60, and 90 day pictures of our clients, right? So Mary looks awesome and like, hey, this is Mary on day one, and now look at her on day 60. Look at her, isn't she amazing? She's dropped 30 pounds, everything has changed. And we put those up in our studios, and we put those on our Facebook ads, and we put them up on our posts, and everyone goes, oh my God, best thing since life bread. And then through no fault of our own, just because we never ever addressed the things that got Mary into that shape in the first place, uh, gradually Mary, Mary starts to say, oh my God, I can't keep this up much longer. These workouts are too much. They're taking too much time. They're killing me. This strict diet is making life not worth living. And I'm hating, I'm hating the fact that my friend's going to do this. And like for, for three months now, I've been, eating, I've been eating lettuce leaves and kind of white chicken, right? And so I, you know, I realized that the results weren't staying for long. I didn't really want to, this was the big transition for me. I didn't really want to stay part of something where the results were transient. It felt like the client was paying me over and over again for the same thing, yeah. right? And it didn't seem in the spirit of what we were supposed to be doing as trainers. Like, we were supposed to be transforming people, and what we were doing instead was changing them. And as you know, kind of through, through doing my programs, I, I, I deem there to be a big distinction between tra change and transformation. Transformation becomes permanent. It means you don't go back anymore. Change is transient. It's back and forward like this, right? So... I then started to get into endocrinology. I went, ah, oh, do you know what? It seems to be the hormones. And if you can just get to the bottom of the hormones, everything will change. And, to, you know, lo and behold, it did, right? So now you have the training, you have the nutrition, and you have the understanding of how to moderate and modulate people's hormones. You know, if you can get the hormones on key, everything changes. And it did. It, like a lot of people that were really resistant, their hormones started to improve, and as their hormones improved, their body started to improve, even without extra changes to the diet and the, and the, and the training. So cool. But there were still these resistant people and there were these, still these people that are going, look, I know exactly what I have to do in order to keep these results. I know exactly. I just can't seem to get myself to do it. Yeah. And I really want it bad and I still can't seem to get myself to do it. And I wake up every day and I look in the mirror and I hate what I see and it causes me to burst into tears and, and lack self-confidence and I'm not having sex with my husband or my wife anymore and my, our relationship is getting rocky and I still can't seem to get myself to do it. Right, so that was where I really got into the more coaching side because that is the ultimate question. I I don't think there's a single person on the planet who knows that sitting at home eating chocolate cakes, Mars bars, and you know, kind of drinking wine every night is a bad idea if what you most want to do is get into this shape. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's never going to get you where you say you want to go. I, I don't know a person on the planet go really, Dex, really, Ryan. Like eating Mars bars is about. I wish someone had told me earlier. Right. I don't know a single person on the planet who's saying that. What everyone I've ever met said, I know a variant of, I know what to do, I just can't seem to get myself to do it. Yeah. 
And it's the same whether it's the body, whether it's a relationship. I, I know I should. I know that if I really want a close relationship with my kids, I should come home every night and nag them and scream at them about their rooms. And I just, I just seem to find myself doing it. I know if I want a close relationship with my husband, I shouldn't, but I just seem to do it. I know if I want to grow a really great business, then what I really need to do is start writing more articles and get in front of people. I just can't seem to get myself to do it. So the question was, I can't seem to get myself to do X. And that's where my big interest and that's where my big turnaround came. Right? Because I, I believe the quality of a person's life comes off the back of how they feel about things and ultimately how they feel about themselves. Now, if you're spending your life feeling that you're in some way diminished, that you're in some way a failure, that you're in some way a loser, that you're in some way imperfect... Does that impact the quality of your life? Of course it does. You go through life with your with your head partly hung and your shoulders rounded in, and you're kind of you're you're kind of trying to make yourself small so that people in the world don't notice you, right? So I was like, I, okay, I, I want to be part of that. I like I, I want to cut through all of the. Do I need to know the biomechanics? Do I need? I'm a, I'm a great biomechanist. I'm a great endocrinologist. I'm a great neurologist. I'm a great like I'm, I'm really good at all these things. I, I don't say that arrogantly or conceitedly. Like these were. The, I've taught all of these subjects around the world, right? I'm really good at them, but all that stuff I know is useless if I can't get you to do it. All of it. Yeah. Here is just follow this diet for the next you know 120 days, and your life will be completely different. Or do these things in your relationship, and your life will be completely different. Everyone will go, "That's great." I just I can't seem to get myself to do it. So my life changed and the lives of my clients changed once I started putting my emphasis on how do I help them answer that question? Like, why aren't I doing what I know I need to do? Yeah. And so that was the direction that I took my career in. And that is really the distinction then between a coach and a trainer. A trainer is all about the training. A nutritionist is all about the nutrition. There's a saying, right, in, in well, I mean, I, I don't know where it kind of originated, but there's a saying that to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. Right to a trainer, a trainer believes everything can be solved through training. A nutritionist believes everything can be solved if you just well, if we jiggle your micros and macros, if we give you a bit more of this and a bit less of that. To an endocrinologist, they believe well, okay, if we get your hormones back in balance, then that's going to change. Right to a to a rehab specialist, they're saying well, let's just fix it. Uh, uh, what, what a coach specialises in, and it's still a diff- different form of hammer and nail, but at least the thing that we're that we're hammering down is is the thing. It's you behave based upon how you. So if you think of it like a hierarchy, you behave down here. You behave based upon what you're saying to yourself. You say to yourself the things that are based upon what you're thinking about yourself. You think to yourself the things that are based upon what you're feeling about yourself. And you feel about yourself the things that your environment is telling you. Okay, this it. You're bigger than everybody else in this room. Therefore, you're fat. They're thin. Therefore, they're more deserving of the accolade, pretty or beautiful or whatever, right? So all of these. So I just wanted to go straight upstream. I wanted to get to the source of the problems and not spend my life poking around down at, down in the effect, yeah. right? Because you can poke around that. It's one of the one of the examples I always give is. You look at yourself and you're like, you've got dirt all over your face and your hair, your hair's a mess, right? You're, you're looking in a mirror and you're going, oh my God, I'm a mess. It doesn't matter how much you reach out to the mirror and try and comb your hair or try and wipe the, wipe the crap off your face. It doesn't matter until you actually do the work on yourself, right? Yeah, people, yeah, no. people, people aren't doing the work in the place that the work is most needed. They're doing the work elsewhere. Yeah. You don't need the work to be I mean, here's the thing. All of those things that you want to happen will happen naturally as a result of taking care of answering the question, I know what to do, but I don't know why I'm doing it. Take care of that, and you'll suddenly start to do those things. So I'm not saying that training is, isn't valuable. I think everyone should be healthy and fit and be active. I'm not saying that nutrition isn't valuable. We should, we should be, be looking after ourselves. And I'm not saying that the endocrinology side of stuff isn't valuable. But it's, all, it's, it's, not, it's not valuable. It's that it's irrelevant until you put the right things in place. Yeah. And most people aren't doing that. That's that's one of the things that I was been leaning towards being a coach. It's like, yeah, you, hands down, I'm not I'm not saying don't want you to, don't want you to train them well because I think training and way you move it affects mood, it affects feelings as well. You've got to be active, and not saying what you eat and and even the person you are when you're eating it, which we, we might cover, uh, isn't effective. Like what you're putting into your body, things that are not allergenic or inflammatory, etc. Not saying that doesn't matter. Because it does, but as you're saying, it's all about um, 
getting people to do that and how we get them to do that. Some people, as you say, um, the intention behind it, if they've got a big intention behind it and it becomes natural and it becomes a habit, it's fine. But it's removing those roadblocks, which we will get into. Um, because uh, one, of the, one of the things that you say on, I've heard you say it before and say it on the course that we're taking, is the thing is not the thing. So someone comes to you and they say, um, Dax, uh, I'm overweight by, I'm three stone overweight, I want to lose three stone in 12 weeks, bang, and you go, okay, um, but that's not really the reason they've come to you. It may, well, it may be the reason, is in the way they look, affecting the way they feel, but um, there's underlying underlying uh, things going on there. So explain us a little bit about what, what, you, what you mean when you say the thing isn't the thing. The thing is the thing. The thing is never the thing, right? So we, we can look at both both sides of the issue, right? So the things that people need to do or feel they need to do and the reasons that they believe they're doing them versus the things that have actually caused them to be in that place in the, in the first place. And the thing is never the thing. Mary comes to you and she's three stone overweight and she says, look, I just want to get into, into great shape. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm not liking my body at the Okay, so why do, you, why do you want to lose this three stone? Because... I've got, a, I've got a holiday coming up in a few months and, and I want to look good on the beach. Why do you want to look good on the beach? Because I want to feel more confident. I've been feeling really self-conscious and I, I, I don't really like the, I'm always covered up and I never get to enjoy my holiday. Okay, so why do you want to feel, feel more confident, right? And then you can peel away and you can peel, people call it peeling the onion, right? You can peel away and you can peel away and you can peel away and you can peel away. And when it gets down to the core core emphasis, like I've had this exact discussion with a client before, and we, we ripped, 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 and ripped away the various layers, and she was her answer started to become, okay, well, I'm kind of ashamed of myself, and when I get into when I get into bed in the evenings, I turn the lights off first before I get undressed. I don't want my husband to see me the way I am. Um, because I'm so so self conscious and ashamed, we rarely make love anymore. We rarely we're, because we're not making love anymore. We're not intimate in other ways. We're not kind of holding hands and being lovey dovey and that kind of stuff when we're, when we're out and about. And because of that, basically, I live my life believing and looking over my shoulder all the time to see like when's the because I'm not having sex with my husband anymore. When's the day he's going to be going off to someone else? Right. Yeah. Right? That's quite the thing is not the thing, right? So she comes to you thinking, and I'm not saying this is for everyone, but I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will go, well, actually, when you boil it down, yeah, here's some of the things I am scared of, right? Or the ways that they value themselves against other, other important people in their lives, right? Kind of, my sister was always the pretty one, right? And kind of, and I always feel really diminished when I'm in her, her company because people always make these beautiful comments about her and isn't your hair nice and doesn't your skin look great and aren't you put together nicely? And I always feel like this, right? And it's a self so it's a self-love thing. At the end of the day, with everyone's issues come down to wanting to be loved and ultimately to wanting to be happy, really. So the thing is not the thing. When you really look at what a coach is selling, a coach is selling a route to fall back in love with yourself, which is ultimately a way to feel happy as you go through life. That's really what we're saying. But that's that's just the thing is not the thing in that direction. Now we can take it in the opposite direction, right? And in the opposite direction, Mary is saying, look, I know that I'm three stone overweight. It's hell, I'm trying to do things, but I just don't know what comes over me. I get home in the evenings, and I know that I'm on a diet, but I get in, I sit in front of, in front of the TV, and before I know it, I'm, I feel myself rushing off to, the, off to the fridge, looking for stuff to eat. I sit down, the next commercial break comes on, and I eat something else that I wasn't supposed to eat, and over and over again, I just don't get it. I don't get why... If I know that I hate myself, if I know that what I really want is to be more intimate with my husband and that's not happening, and blah, 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 blah. if I know all of that, why the hell do I keep raiding in the fridge? Right? And now, now we, we go back in the other direction. The thing is not the thing. Mary's coming home, she's stressed, she's exhausted, she's unhappy, right? And she's not addressing the things that have made her stressed. And stress, the way, the way that stress affects her is it, it brings her into emotional eating. Yeah. So she, we take that upstream and now ultimately if she's not having that conversation either with the boss who keeps dumping files on her desk at 10 minutes to 5 every night before she goes home, sending her into a whirlwind of stress and threat, then if she never has that conversation, this is another way to look at it, she never has the conversation with the boss who does that 10 minutes to 5 every night, 
She's always, she's never going to lose the lose the weight. Which means, and if she's never going to lose the weight, she's never going to feel secure in a relationship with her husband. If she never feels secure in a relationship with her husband, she's never going to feel happy. She never you know she's never going to feel love. She never feels love. She's never going to feel happy. So by not having the conversation with the boss about having the the files dumped on her desk and this big ultimatum ultimatum delivered to her ten to five, she's costing herself a relationship with her husband and her happiness. This is something Not that um, probably a lot of people will be like, oh, well, like, this is, it goes to places that people just don't even think about. As you say, like a trainer nutritionist, they're talking about food and training. Whereas this goes into, you say, environments and how they affect us in a big way. And put us in, you use the word a threat, which I know your students will know about. Um, most, most of the public won't really understand what you mean by threat, which we can go into a little bit, but it just shows people how um, really the thing definitely isn't the thing in terms of how far down that, that river it can go, upstream or downstream. So so when you when you talk about threat, um, putting someone into threat and, and how they react, um, what, what, do you, what do you mean by that, just just so people can get a little grasp on it? Really, there's, there's three things, right? So there's inability to predict the future, like, as in, I don't know what's coming next. Like, you and I are able to have this conversation calmly, cleanly right now because there isn't a fire in your backyard and there's all firemen running across the place, right? If, you know, you're, if that was happening like this second, if you were on threat, like, like your, your house is burning down, we're not able to sit here and have these kind of intellectual conversations about stuff. Your brain now goes into fight, flight, and freeze and says, oh, my God, you know, there's, there's something I have to do right now. Like, and this is so much more important than this intellectual based conversation yeah well we the, the things that we want to do in our lives are based around intellectual based conversations both with other people but more importantly ourselves there's a conversation I have to have inside of my head in order to say okay what do I want to do and this is the right prefrontal cortex this is part of the brain here where do I want to go what do I want to be how do I want to be in six months why is that important to me and this is, a, this is the ability to say, do you know what? If I keep this up, in six months I'll be feeling awesome about my body. And if I'm feeling awesome about my body, I feel more confident. If I feel more confident, me and my husband will start to, start to connect a lot more. And as we start to connect, that's all right prefrontal cortex. Left prefrontal cortex has another thing going on, an intellectual conversation, which is going, okay, so that's what you want. How do I help you get it? Right, which is awesome. So this is this is the bit that's all dreamy, all the all those movie scenes and TV shows where they go doo -doo -doo -doo, and they get all that wavy dream scene, right? So this is all the dreamy part of the brain, and it's all the logic, Doctor Spock part of the brain says, ah, so this is what you want, kind of. You want to do this, this, this. This is the first thing you need to do. This is the second thing you need to do. This is the third thing. When you're under threat, it's like someone comes along and switches off both of those parts of the brain, and now you act emotional, you act reactive. Kind of, you're no longer responding to your environment. Instead, you're saying, okay, well, I know I'm on a diet, but I'm so hungry and I'm going to stick my head in the top of Hagen Dazs and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. right? <laughs> that's, that's what you actually do, by the way. I'm just, I'm just emphasizing that. This is, this, is what ends up, this is what ends up happening because the logical part of you and the creative part, the bit of you that remembers the future that you want for yourself would never do that. The bit of you that remembers the future says, well, hold on, that's a really bad idea. Like, Eating this hagen dust right now is a really bad idea. And the logical part of you would go, well, hold on, this isn't on the plan. That's not part of the idea, right? And the only way you can possibly think it's a good idea is that actually you're not thinking at all anymore. You've moved into another part of your brain because you're in threat. Because threat is all about reactivity. You start to become reactive. And you're, you're just going to fight, flight, and freeze. You're no longer responsive. You're purely reactive. And so it's about predictions and responses, ultimately. Uh, if you, the bigger the prediction, the bigger the response about what's going on in your environment, the more like, okay, I've, I've already had a word with the boss and I've told him it's unacceptable. You know, yes, you're my boss. I really love working here. But it's unacceptable to dump stuff on my desk at 10 to 5 and they put me under that amount of pressure when you come home, right, when I'm, coming, when I'm, go when I'm just about to go home. That really puts me under a lot of stress. Prediction and response by having had the difficult conversation with the boss means that you're not going to come home and, and stick your head in a tub of hogging us. Or um, having steps in place, if that does happen. Right, that, that they exactly. Don't, that, Response part, right? Yeah, that they don't know. So this is, um, I sort of, uh, like when you say, basically it's when people are actually out of their mind. So, for example, when, you might even see on a sports field, uh, someone comes in with a bad tackle on a player, the player gets up and, and headbutts him, for example. 
And yeah. you go, oh, everyone goes, oh my God, that's disgusting behavior. But at that point, that person was under threat and he probably was literally out of his mind. Yeah. So he didn't even, he was reacting in a different part of his brain that you think, well, he just wanted to, he just wanted to feel safe. And his brain was like, how do I feel safe? I've done something to remove the threat and it's gone away. But in, uh, in Western civilization, you can't act like that. But it's right. just parts of the brain that, that um, we still have and we go into. But people don't seem to understand that, which is, which is a, big, a big part of becoming a coach and getting people to understand how, right. how these, these things act. So, um, so that's covering that's covered threat. So we went into a little bit about, um, I mentioned a little bit before, we were talking about nutrition, but um, from a term, from a perspective of, how do you say, sometimes it's not what we eat. So, I mean, in general, you want people to eat clean, but it's who you are when you're eating this food. And so people can, if for example, people can go, and it's amazing, like some people will eat food. Um, I think I've heard, maybe it might, might have been you before or someone else uh, talk about the French paradox. Um, mm. And this is something that I think a lot of, say, nutritionists or other coaches, etc., seem to forget about, which is who we are when we eat. So can you just go a little bit into that for people? Mm. What I'll say first is that kind of since I introduced this concept, this kind of messed with a lot of people's minds, right? Because we're we we like a very mechanistic approach. We like to look at pure calories in, calories out, and people call into call into play all kinds of things like the kind of laws of thermoregulation and all kinds of stuff, right? And miss out. I'm, it's not my job here to kind of get into all of that and persuade anybody of anything. But put it this way. The, when, when it comes to the French paradox is, is one area that we can look at first. The French and Mediterraneans, like a lot of the Mediterranean countries, for the longest time were kind of, if you want to put it that way, got away with kind of very strange eating practices compared to what we tell people to do. Right. Like, if diets are largely wheat and there's like a lot of fat like fish and oils and cheeses and right, right. all of these kind of stuff. And yeah, and, for, and yet for the longest time, the ability, they had the ability to kind of remain... The, the least amount of obesity, the least amount of, um, you know, the, the least amount of heart disease and coronary risk factors. And what we, what we started to do was to look at these various ideas of, ah, oh, well, Mediterraneans, they're, they're eating a lot of fish oil, right? And then, or olive oil. And then we start to look at, ah, oh, right, they're, they're consuming a lot of fish oil. And then we started to look at, look at people over in Asia and, ah, oh, a lot of coconut oil. And it isn't to say any of these things aren't really great, but look at, look at a lot of these cultures and, and how they operate nutritionally versus us. What they, what they have a much more of a tendency to do, or did have much more of a tendency to do, because, because unfortunately a lot of these practices are diminishing. And as the practices are diminishing in these countries, they're starting to see a lot more of the same risk factors appearing, right? But what they, what they used to do traditionally was that life would stop for food. Everyone would go, like, it would be a social event. Siestas, right? Everything was shut down in the middle of an afternoon. Yeah. Kind of, that, so families would come together, they'd sit around the table, there'd be a lot of communication, there'd be, a, there'd be a, lot of, a lot of good food, but often a lot of food, and also a lot of things that we, we certainly in the UK and in the US would say, oh, they're not getting too much wheat and too much of this and too much of that, right? And they're doing all the wrong things, and yet they're able to maintain their health and a lot of their physique too. How is that possible? Well, it's because ultimately, you the, the storyline that I put forward is that you are you, basically it's not what you eat; it's who you are when you eat it. And so, if you think if I, if I'm under threat, if I'm in a lot of stress right now, what happens is my my nervous system switches over to become what's known as sympathetic nervous system dominant. I mean, fight or flight. My my energy is all about get up and go, right? Which is great, like the energy runs to my muscles mostly and there's muscle tension and everything else. What, it, what that means though is that my energy runs away from my gut and my digestive and metabolic and, and, and um, detoxification systems, right? I, I become a mostly external creature. Sympathetic nervous system is really mostly about what, what the external musculature and everything else is going to do, right? The, when you go parasympathetic, the other branch of the nervous system, you become a much more internalized creature, right? We say, you know, start to think the big thoughts and feel the big feelings and, and kind of it's all about digestion and re regeneration and regrowth and repair, right? If, if I'm eating food on the go, stressed at my desk, in an argument with someone else, watching TV, violent movie, all kinds of stuff, I'm staying in my, in my sympathetic branch of my nervous system. 
if I'm staying in that branch of my nervous system, I am not geared up for pure digestion, for detoxification, for ultimate metabolization of the foods that I'm eating. Right? So, that yes. Picture, that picture you painted there, I think a lot of people could uh, be quite, quite familiar with that. Eating right. at their desk at work, watching TV or grabbing something on the go. Um, I think that that's what a lot of people would consider lunch time. I right. suppose, yeah. Right. So, at the desk on the go, right? Yeah. So, so what you're saying is, doing this has led to obviously they're not being able to digest the food properly. They're not being able to um, ex- um, extract the nutrients from their food, and leads to ultimately weight gain. Is that correct? Right, because digestion begins in the mouth. So when you're a sympathetic nervous system driven, your enzyme pool is smaller, right? You don't produce as many of the enzymes. So digestion begins in the mouth, and already because of parasympathetic, less enzymes. It, it changes. It changes the. Um, it changes the hydrochloric acid levels in the stomach. Okay, so there's there's less both cleansing of the food and the pre maceration, the pre breakdown of those foods. There's less of a bile, uh, less of a bile input, right? So kind of the bile that comes off the liver that is the, that is responsible for turning that solid food into another into a form of liquid called chyme. That reduces, okay? The, the uh, your your villi and microvilli kind of the the little doorways actually allow the food into your bloodstream that, that, so that the nutrients can be carried around. The, they they change when you're when you're in your sympathetic nervous system. The speed at which the pipes, right, the kind of the, the small and large intestine move everything around, that slows down massively. So now we have we have food effectively, one way to think of it is like food decomposing inside of the body rather than moving naturally through it and getting out. And now we start to see all kinds of things like IBS and colitis and uh, you know, kind of and then then we've got everything that comes off the back of that, like acne breakouts and you name it, right? All of those, all of those things, hair, teeth, skin, nails, yeah, all of that starts to go down off the back of a nervous system that is permanently plugged into being sympathetically driven. Yeah. Okay? So, and you can still be on a really good diet and you can be taking all the supplements God sends. You can rattle when you walk, right? But if your nervous system isn't geared up for extracting the nutrients in the first place, as I always like to describe to people, essentially, you're creating extremely expensive piss. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> right? It's expensive urine. Like you, the more supplements you take, if you're not going to do the work of getting into your, into your parasympathetic branch of your nervous system, if you're not going to do that work, your supplements are creating very expensive urine. This is this could go off. <laughs> I can see and talk all day about this. This is something which is uh, really interests me as well. This is this is the sort of thing where um, you say it's a well, holistic approach works. You look at mind, body, and soul. You look at the person as a whole, and you see what they're doing. What whilst they are doing things as well. So it's why a lot of the Eastern philosophies. I know you're a big fan of them. So am I. Um, get people to relax and really go and, and really. Uh, Get, even their breathing, the way that they're, the way they're living, the way they're moving, the way they're thinking, it's it's a huge part. And ultimately, that's what coaches are trying to do, isn't it? They're trying to make people um, not get to that stage where they're right. under threat or they're in their in the wrong nervous system, so they can think correctly, digest correctly, and live. Correctly. I've noticed it in myself, and if you have. Um, Say people say cheat meal. You shouldn't really say cheat meal because at the end of the day, it means you're trying to put a restriction on things. But if I want to have a, a meal that's not generally what I would consider a healthy option, um, these days I'm just not stressed about it. I just go and I do it, and it's just made things a lot easier. And I think if people started to to take that sort of um, view of things, it would make a big difference to them. Um, yeah. Just just my little. Five, five pence worth there. We, we, call that, we call that three joys, right? Yeah. So the, the three joys is, is really simply this. Like, if it's, I believe, heart and soul, because I've seen so many people now, like right? hundreds, even thousands of people now, who have adopted a different way of addressing nutrition, who have dropped weight spontaneously, really, really quickly, really easily, without fuss, without hassle, without ever counting a calorie or anything else, right? Um, and what, what I've noticed is that when they bring bring my three joys process into, into play, life gets really easy. And it's this, Net, first is, is the joy before eating, never eat while stressed, like be joyous, and be joyous in the bit like, um, do you know what, I'm really looking forward to dinner tonight, like dinner's going to be great, I've got these awesome veggies, I've got this, I've got that, 
right? The, even the joy in shopping for it, right? So, kind of, oh, right, I'm going to have that versus this. A lot of people tell themselves the story that they haven't got time to cook. Stories. Right? And it is a story. Like, everyone has time to cook because, like, you, people don't tend to walk in from their house, like, go into the kitchen and uh, just keep moving until bedtime, no. right? If they do, they're often filling their day with a whole bunch of stuff that is unnecessary. But kind of people, people don't need to do that, right? So they're filling their time with something. One of the things that I found is if I slow my clients down, I actually have them spend a bit more time in the kitchen, not less, more, right? So they have joy in the preparation of their food. Oh, this is going to be really good. And I want to, like, one of the things I always look at is if I were coming around to your house tonight for dinner, you probably wouldn't feed me the way, well, I don't know how you feed yourself, Ryan, but kind of, a, most people wouldn't feed me as their guest yeah. the, way, the way they feed themselves, which is just like slop some stuff on a plate or eat out a Tupperware thing or whatever, right? Go, no, we've got, we've got people coming around tonight. We've got to make it nice, right? Yeah, yeah. Why? Because you want them to have a nice experience and you wouldn't just say have great or dripping off the side of the plate and kind of things all just heaped up on top of each other. But we feed ourselves like that. And if we slow down in the preparation of our food and we slow down in the, okay, this is going to look nice. Like one of my rules for food is like, make sure it looks nice. Look nice. Don't eat out of, like, don't tie the thing up in Tupperware boxes and hate it. And yeah, yeah. Have white, right? So have the joy in the build-up to the food. Have the joy during the food. And that means don't ever eat while you're distracted by other stuff. Either, you, like, one of, I don't place many rules on people, but kind of one of the things I often say it's really simply this. If you don't have time to eat, don't eat. If you don't have time to eat, don't eat, right? Yeah, yeah. Because if I don't have got time to eat, then what I'm eating is just basically dumping more food into a sympathetic nervous system that can't use it. Yeah. So, so if I'm going to eat it, sit down and be with it and be with the food and taste the food as it's going in. And, right, and I'm one of the worst people in the world for this. I'm, I'm ex-military, right? Kind of, and plus council estate where we didn't have much money, right? Ex-military, though, we were taught to eat our food as quickly as we possibly could, right? It was, it was all about kind of get the food in you and, and get back on duty, right? So I naturally consume food quickly. It's like, so I have to be really conscientious and really, really focused about, okay, I'm slowing this down. I have to be mindful about slowing things down. That's a great word to use, yeah, being mindful. I think in terms of everything, because it's almost moving. I know it, the way the world's going and everything's getting faster and we're always on the go and that's probably... Massively to do with a lot of problems here, but right. we need to sort of go back to how it was, which can be hard if you it's drops. But as right. you said, people say they don't have the time, but generally they do, they just fill that time with nonsense. I mean, we're all right. guilty of it, we're, we're all guilty of it, like watching just trying to switch off, but if they just take the time. Um, but yeah, that that's that's a huge point being, mind, being mindful. Yeah. Most of us are mindless about how we eat our food, yeah. very mindless. And then the last, last of the three joys, so there's joy before, there's joy during, and then there's joy after, right? And that, even the joy after can help you make the decision about whether you should be eating this meal. Yeah. Right? I'm not into shoulds or shouldn't very much, right? But if I know I'm going to give myself crap after I've eaten it, like, I'm going to, I've got a craving for this, but I know I'm going to talk crap about myself after it's over. Oh, you silly sod, you should never eat that. You're on a diet. Then simply don't eat it. Like, ask yourself the question, could I, if, if I eat this, will I be joyous about it after? Will I say, do you know what? That was the best cheesecake and bottle of wine I've, I've eaten and drunk in a long time. They were brilliant. I loved drinking that. Or am I going to go, oh, no, I shouldn't have eaten that. I'm such a fat slob. And I'm, oh, what, what am I doing drinking booze when I'm supposed to be on the, right? If I'm going to give myself crap about it, after and simply don't eat it. So if you've got those three joys present, the person you're eating, oh sorry, the person you are while you're eating doesn't eat both. <laughs> but the person you are while you're eating is a very, very different person to to the person that most of us find ourselves to be. Stressed before, trying to get it done as quickly as possible, eating mindlessly and then giving ourselves crap after we've eaten it. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Really different experience. Yeah, if you're if you, you say if you're gonna be guilty of it, just don't do it. Otherwise just enjoy it. And I think that's a that's a huge point to put put across. Um, loads of people will will experience, especially in my opinion, opinion uh, especially in my experience, they have experienced, especially in my experience, that um, that feeling of guilt afterwards, and that's yeah. just not a great place for anyone to be in because that that pushes them even more into threat and even more into into doing possibly things that are going to uh, have a knock on effect, which aren't going to aren't going to serve them well. So. It's amazing that this coaching, you say coaching goes in, into this, this whole um, 
Yeah, it's a holistic approach, really. It's just it's just another way of putting it um, because that's the only way to actually affect long lasting change. So, well, say long lasting change in in your experience and in your uh, opinion, long lasting say change, long lasting transformation is what we're going after, and these these aspects is that what what how you say is the is the key to to getting someone to change for a, the long time the long term rather than the short term yeah, yeah I see, see most people most people's experience of you know the, the word transformation gets thrown around a lot right now right kind of transformation contests and transformation programs and blah, 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 everything's transformation but the reality is most people are caught up in change and they're constantly caught in change and actually change is another form of threat to the nervous system Constant change is extremely threatening. Yeah. So you look at you look at okay, I'm going to try and get in get in shape. But most people's experience of getting into shape, right, is is this even if it's working for them, even if every time they step on the scales they go, I've dropped another five pounds this week, and they get temporarily excited, right? But their experience of change is one of restriction, deprivation, control, right? All of these things that make their lives worse, not better. Mm. Right? So they look in the mirror and they look a bit better and they step on the scales and they feel a bit better because of that. But generally, they're like, the, the question in most people's minds is, when the hell will this be over? When can I stop doing this? When can I get off this diet? When, can I, when won't I have to go to the gym so frequently? Most people aren't looking at ways to sustain it. They're saying, you know, and they get, they get to the end of their 90 days and they go, thank God, that's over. Right? Yeah, because one of the things quickly I say is like people look at cover models and they think, Oh my god, I want to look like that. And people don't realise that cover models don't really look like that a lot of the yeah. time. Um, and the ones that do genetically are pretty pretty gifted, or they might have had a little bit of help from somewhere sometimes. Um, and that's what people's body image. And you're you're saying like, yeah, but but get people to enjoy and not co- and and create long lasting change. As you said, if they're not enjoying it, right? They're just counting down the days until. So one, yeah. So one of the ways I've always described that is that you'll never create, and it doesn't matter what, you know, at the moment we're talking about like from a physical perspective, right? But this could the same be relationship, this could be a business, it could be anything. You'll never create the body and the life and the business and the relationship or any of those things that you love while doing the things you loathe. Because the things that you loathe, the things that you really don't want to do are the things that you're always, always, always going to have to use willpower to do. And willpower eventually runs out and you go, thank God that's over. Until you get enough pain again and you look in the mirror one that you go, okay, I lost three stone, I feel awesome, I didn't manage to keep it off, it came back on again, and you get to that point where you feel crappy about yourself again, and you start the process over and over again. And each time you start it over, it's harder to lose the weight, and each time you, each time it's, it's not only harder to lose the weight, you become less and less of a believer that the weight's ever going to stay off, right? Yeah, Versus it's transformation, which is, which is you only go in one direction. Transformation is I'm always heading north. I'm never going to come back south again. I'm, I'm always heading north. And you can only do that, you're, like you'll only, do, you'll only continue to do the things that you enjoy. Like for your entire, there are things in your life that you don't have to be, uh, you don't, you know, think to yourself, oh, I wonder if I should do something. You just love doing it, so you do it. It's only the things that you don't enjoy, you go, okay, I know I should be doing this tonight, and okay, I'm going to take the time out. You don't enjoy it, you're going to make yourself do it. Right? You'll only create the life you love by doing the things you love, yep. love. If you if you do the things you love, it's never going to work. And it's just getting people um, to, to remove certain threats around their environment, which allow them to do this. Um, another one, like people, people might or might or may not know Tony Robbins, but he said talks about the stories that people create around around these things. And once you can change their their state of mind around around certain stories, then you've basically got them onto a winner, which is which is huge. So. Just one of the things that we, we'll probably, because it's been 45 minutes now, I'll let you go in a minute, but um, just just going to just gonna say, how do you, to uh, someone that comes up to you in, in a pub, for example, or in a restaurant or at a show, and they say, oh, um, so what do you do then? So how would you, how would you describe what transformational coaching is? Can I see a big smile on your face? <laughs> I'm really because I know you've been, you've been waiting for the answer to this one. So, I used to try and explain the definition of a coach, right? 
And I've got lots of definitions because, you know, as you know from the Guru Project, I believe it's, you know, a, a coach is a guru, essentially, someone who's moving you from your darkness into your life. But so for some people, like, the, you know, it's a bit too esoteric, it's a bit woo, it's a bit too flowery. As a, and some of, the, some of the actual, well, I do this, 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 some of that is a bit too mechanical for people, yeah, yeah. right? Right? Okay, I help you find this and I help you do that and I help you, right? So the way I describe it now is I, and it's great the way you ask this because you think about it, it's in a social situation, yeah, right? Yeah. So the way I describe it is very socially, just ch it's just a chit chat. And I say, you know how in your life there are lots of things that you really want to do and you know how to, you know what you've got to do, but you just don't know why you can't seem to get yourself to do them or do them, do them consistently. I help people with that. I help people find the answer to that. Strategist. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Right? But that, essentially, that's what I say. And then they, they'll say to me, well, how do you do that? Right? And then I start to take them into the story. But essentially, my description of it is you know how. Right? You know how, and I'll, I'll describe it via your experiences. Right? You, you, know, you know how there are lots of things that, that you want to be able to accomplish. There are lots of things that you want to be able to do. There are lots of things that you want to be able to stop doing, but you can't understand why, why you're still doing them, even though you hate it. I help people understand why that's still, why that's still in their lives. And then you uh, probably and then create, the, create the strategy to make the change. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a great way of putting it. Um, and that can be around, as you say, anything. So that's fantastic. Um, okay, Dex. Well, just so people know, if any of you want to contact Dex, um, he's got a couple of websites: um, www.daxmoy.com or www.daxfit.com. Daxfitlife. Yeah. Daxfitlife.com. Um, I'm sure you can get his information through, or you can go up to his uh, studio in Upper Street um, if you want. But um, yeah. that's up to you. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Dax. It's been a quite eye opening. I think that will uh, change a lot of people's perspectives on things. And it'll, uh, probably, so. probably are, are they probably um, if you want to ask more questions after that, which is what usually coaching happens in coaching is. Hey, why don't you post this? But you know, I'm happy to do a Q and A session with you as well. So, kind of, if a lots of loads of questions come back, we can Q and A them as well. Awesome. Um, so, Vax, have a great day. Thanks for that, and um, speak to you soon. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye. So, guys, that was episode 34 with Dax Moy, all about the brain and how it affects you and how it can impact on your results. And just daily life, really. I mean, I hope you got something out of that. I'm guessing you, you would have done because it's a topic that people don't really tend to t uh, talk about very much, especially in the coaching world. It's all about motivation and mindset, etc. But people don't really understand how big uh, a part the brain plays. Not just in, people think of it as, as, a, as a thing for intelligence and IQ, etc. But they don't realize how much of an impact it has on you um, in terms of, Getting you ready for um, safety, getting ready, for, keeping you, keeping you safe, getting you, getting you ready for any environment that's around you, looking for threat, making sure that you are um, able to, to to feel safe, so safe that you can actually access your human brain, your thoughts, your feelings, your um, goals. I mean, it's a huge topic, and it's one I said before. I'm going to be touching on um, again. So. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, guys, any questions you got for me, head on over to www.reviveyourself.co and contact and send them over there and I'll get to them. And as, as before I said, if you've got any chronic illness or that you know anyone who's got any Ill, illness to, to, to do with gut issues, skin issues, thyroid, adrenal fatigue, chronic fatigue, whatever it may be, um, and this sort of depression, etc., then give them uh, the, the address of www.reviveyourself.co and... Put them on. Put them on our free four-day mini course where they're going to learn a lot about how they can put these things behind them. Otherwise, guys, that's it for this week. We've got a great interview with Dr. Hounsler coming up, all about blue light and the impact it has on you, um, the negative impacts it has on you when you are actually exposed to it when you shouldn't be. So that's next week. Otherwise, guys, stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye bye. <laughs> If you're struggling with gut issues, such as gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, indigestion, heartburn, and want to finally be able to eat the foods you love without the crippling after effects, then don't forget to head over to reviveyourself.co and pick up your free copy of The Healing Health Paradigm today.